All right. So welcome, everyone. So grateful to have everybody here. We know we'll have some more folks joining in just a moment. I wanted to let folks know that we do have ASL interpreters who are available. Live transcription is also turned on. So if you wanted to activate that, you're absolutely welcome to do so. so I have the wrong date on this webinar because apparently I decided to go backwards in time. Um, so my name is Miranda Styers. My pronouns are they, them, and I am joining from Nisaman, Miwok, and Medu land in what is now known as Sacramento. Wanted to give folks just a quick overview of our control panels. On your screen, you should be able to see the option to expand audio for call-in information. So if you have any trouble hearing on your what? computer, you can switch to phone audio and vice versa. You can turn on your camera. Um, you can disable it if you want to. Absolutely, you are welcome to. Know that we are being, we are recording this webinar so that we will have it uploaded into our resource library by Monday. If you have questions or comments, you can absolutely send those to the presenters or you can send that to the general chat. So for our agenda, we're gonna have our opening circle and we wanna know who is joining us and where are folks joining us from. Today, we're gonna to be talking about our Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month campaign. And we're incredibly excited to share that with everyone and hope you've had an opportunity to look at it. If not, that's all right. We're gonna walk you through today. And at the theme for this year is Uplift One Another with Youth in the Lead. We have a number of presenters and so we're gonna let folks introduce themselves as they join us. First, I wanted to do our land acknowledgement. Um, and we have, we have a general statement and you'll notice whenever partnership staff join webinars, um, meetings, et cetera, we always are going to acknowledge the lands that we are joining from because it's incredibly important to remember our history of this country and acknowledge that we're on the traditional territories and homelands of California native people. And this isn't something that is in the past Native people are still here and thriving and we need to acknowledge that. If you are wondering whose lands you are currently living on, you can put in, oop, it's not working for me, but I will get that in the chat for everyone to be able to introduce and to learn whose land they are occupying. So if folks wanna use the chat, please type in your name, pronouns, your agency and location. We'd love to hear about who's joining us. And I see we already have. Perfect. Thank you, Kimmy. <clears throat> right. So go ahead and start introducing. Yes, I have spotlight myself. Thank you so much for that reminder. I am learning, absolutely. All right, welcome Jessica, of course. And Kate and Dorothy. Love it, we have folks from all over joining. Good spread of folks from across the state. That's awesome. That's great, thank you so much. As those continue to come in, I'm gonna go ahead and give our chance to introduce themselves as well. All right, so with that, I am gonna go ahead and pass the mic to Michelle. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Michelle, um, I'm with the partnership. Um, let's see, my pronouns are she, her, hers, 
And I am calling in today from Miwok land. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. And hey everyone, I'm also on the comms team. My name is Jess Merrill, pronouns she and her. And uh, today I am joining from Yokuts, Bay Miwok and Mawakama land in Lafayette Bay area. Megan? Her, and I'm coming to you on Nisanon land um, in the Sierra Nevada foothills. Um, it's great to be in community with you today. Before we go, I just wanted to give Kimmy and Melody, our newest prevention specialists, a moment to introduce themselves for folks who haven't had an opportunity to meet them. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Melody Chris Bowden. I use she, her, a of pronouns. I am a new prevention specialist with the partnership, um, and I am calling in from Los Angeles on Tongva land. And hi, everyone. I'm Kimmy Remus, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the other new prevention specialist here at the partnership, and I am calling from Susquehannock, Piscataway, and Antigo land, which is now known as Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you. So I think we're ready to begin. Um, Michelle, did you want to introduce the uh, Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month campaign? And then I don't know if it's helpful to share our screens now uh, for the web page or after you do the intro. Okay, so um, our theme uh, for this year's Teen Day Violence Awareness and Prevention Month is um, uplift one another. And so this was um, a theme that was chosen by our um, youth graphic designer, uh, which our youth artists, uh, which Megan will share more about later. Um, but we thought that this just perfectly encompassed everything we wanted to talk about with um, teen dating violence. Um, you know, it encompasses this idea of um, uplifting your community, uplifting the people around you, uplifting yourself. Um, and so this is a great way to talk about primary prevention. Um, and so the Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month started off this year with a focus group where we got together a bunch of teens as well as preventionists from around California. And we asked them, you know, what would they want to see in a campaign? And so they uh, came up with a few themes. So they wanted to connect with other youth across the state. Um, they also wanted to um, take action. Um, and then a lot of preventionists wanted to figure out how to authentically connect with um, younger people. And, you know, they also express that there's been um, a lot of difficulty connecting with youth during the pandemic um, and also just in general. Um, and so that's how we came up with our campaign. <laughs> um, so let's see, our uh, first major campaign event was um, Orange Day. And so we wanted to turn that into um, uh, Orange Day of Action. Um, and one of the things we're working on is getting $15 million in prevention funding into the California budget. And so we wanted to turn Orange Day into a day of action. And so um, with the youth, um, we reached out to preventionists. So hopefully you received um, a letter from one of the youth uh, to send on to other youth about um, how to take action and our toolkits. Um, and we're hoping to encourage people to do that all month long. All right, Jess, do you wanna take it away with the next section? Sure. And Megan, I was wondering if you might be able to share your screen um, to show the page as well. Sure, sorry, I didn't realize you wanted <laughs> Sorry, I would, I just, I don't have two like uh, computer monitors with me, so it's 
I can see my notes at the same time. Oh, no, that's fine. I, I just feel like usually in PPNs, Miranda does that. And I wasn't oh, on. got it. Got it. Okay. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about, let's see. So if you scroll down uh, just a bit. Pain events. Okay. So I want to talk about the youth discussion around healthy relationship education and community organizing. Um, so uh, this will take place Monday, February 28th from 4.30 to 6. And one of the major themes we heard from youth during the focus group is that they wanted to learn from their peers about how they're working to uh, prevent teen dating violence in various communities across the state. And so one of the things we strive toward a partnership is being a network weaver. So a youth convening fits squarely within our purpose. Um, as we continue to be guided by youth in the Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month Advisory Committee, they developed a number of specific questions and focus areas that now serve as the framework of the event. These presentation areas are approaches to self and community care, outreach during the pandemic, intersectional approaches to prevention, building solidarity, and community organizing 101. So in addition to learning from one another, uh, we hope to create a shared space that acknowledges the added anxiety and stress of the pandemic and the creativity and resilience of youth as well. As well. Uh, we're striving to make this feel the space feel safe for self-expression. So we're very excited to welcome two youth from Peace Over Violence who will read original poetry around these topics in the opening and the closing. We'll also have presenters from Center for the Pacific Asian Family, House of Ruth, Genesee Center, and the partnership as well. All youth who register and attend will receive $50 for their participation since we know their time is valuable and will contribute to our shared goals around um, ending teen dating violence. And I think Michelle, you covered the action item around funding. I think we're looking at social media, so I'll pass the mic to Megan. Yep, so for our social media, I think um, we already saw a bunch of folks use um, the graphics template that's linked here. Um, we know that a lot of folks are um, working with Canva. Um, and so we tried to make that as accessible as possible um, and put it straight into Canva and you can use it um, using your own Canva account. Um, and it's a really good um, multi-purpose template. The artwork was created by our youth artist. Um, and um, we already saw it being used for Orange Day, but you can use it throughout the rest of the month as well uh, for any other of your um, Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month needs. Um, we also have a little mini toolkit here. There's a few bulleted questions that Melody helped put together um, that you can um, ask youth uh, in your own programs. Um, and really elevate their voices and uh, really put youth in the lead um, into action and then um, take their responses and um, insert them into that graphics uh, template to um, make uh, even more content for the month. Um, we also have a quick disclaimer here about um, practicing um, consent uh, when you're sharing uh, this information and uh, informing the youth know how this information will be used and what information will be used. Um, and of course, as preventionists, I'm sure you probably know that sometimes uh, some of those uh, parent or guardian forms need to be filled out um, when you're doing uh, content like that. Um, and then you'll see here the rest of the artwork that um, our youth artists created. There is a general campaign um, image sized for Instagram um, here that you can download and post um, if you'd like to um, create connections back to this campaign of, um, of uplifting one another. Um, and then also, if you'd like to join in in our Zoom backgrounds um, and show those off, we have um, that where you can download it here as well. Um, so I think our next section is talking about um, this uh, guide. So I'll pass it back over to Jess. 
Awesome, thank you. Um, Megan, would you mind going to that guide with the link there? Okay, thanks so much. Uh, so it has been an amazing process working with the subcommittee for the youth-led outreach toolkit, which was created for adult preventionists and allies. We know it has been difficult to continue your outreach during the pandemic, we heard you. So we wanted to connect you directly with the lived experiences and expertise of three youth who really dug deep to provide support in um, how you build meaningful relationships with youth during your outreach process, um, increasing inclusivity, and also building solidarity among clubs. Uh, could you go on to the next page, Megan? Thank you. So one of the themes that stood out was diminishing the power dynamic between adults and youth. So how can we stand behind youth and empower their decision-making? Um, and one way that came across was setting a true example of, of healthy relationships um, by being equitable ourselves as adults, uh, being non-judgmental, et cetera. And if you could go to uh, the next page and then the one after that, Megan. Perfect. Um, I wanted to share this- By awesome collaborating video. with cultural clubs, Sorry, uh, that's the beauty of Canva, but also in presentations, it just starts playing. So uh, Christopher Petrosian, who is a part of the No More Club uh, with Marjorie Mason Center, created this video. Um, he had some really good ideas on how to um, connect our cultural responsiveness efforts with prevention um, and really just build solidarity um, among campus clubs. So uh, I wanted to play this short video as a preview to the guide. By collaborating with cultural clubs, it opens up many opportunities. It allows for an event to happen that will bring visibility to the cause as well as showing solidarity. Some clubs I see being most effective are those that involve dance, such as Folklorico, Monk Dance Clubs, and BSU Stomp. Dance allows for a visual performance to catch attention as well as connecting dance and education to the topic. Another potential aspect of this idea is educating dancers so they could participate in educational booths, if possible, in the costumes. The association of the cultural costumes with education around this topic will definitely make people think about it. And so this approach is very important as it includes more people along with breaking any stigma surrounding dating violence within those communities. While cultural dance programs can vary from school to school, said programs are a useful tool in gaining visibility, breaking stigma, and reaching out to more people. So it's definitely something to look into. And, and that actually perfectly coincided with uh, the leaf blowing that was happening outside. So that just went away. Um, yeah, so this is just a, a preview of the toolkit. I hope that you have gotten a chance to look at it um, before this presentation. And I think that ends my little section. Thank you. I think, uh, we were going to pass it maybe to Michelle, maybe talk about the proclamation. Yes, yeah, so um, well, it's kind of later in the month, but um, you know, one of the actions you can take for uh, TDVAM is um, to pass a local proclamation in your city council or maybe school board to acknowledge this month as Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month. And um, it just helps you connect more with your local school board members, as well as educate them on the issue. Um, the other thing is uh, I've also included uh, the interactive stories, um, the prevention across uh, California um, links so that people can uh, know how they can make a difference in their everyday um, interactions. And then Megan, do you want to take it away with the visual artist? Sure. Um, so right at the bottom of the page, you'll um, get the chance to learn a little bit more about our youth artist, Nina Wang. Um, her bio is here um, and you can uh, even check out her art on Instagram. Um, she has some really great skills uh, that she used um, here um, to uh, create this uh, 
visual piece of artwork and adapt it to a bunch of different sizing formats for the campaign. Um, she also has an artist statement that she sent over explaining a little bit about the piece, why she chose um, up, Uplift One Another as the theme um, and kind of what all of these um, little bubbles represent. Um, so from here, um, I think we have the uh, page linked in the chat. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, but we just had a bunch of questions, not a bunch. <laughs> we had a few questions for you all um, about the campaign, how to uh, teen dating violence awareness and prevention month is going for you and how we can um, support you. So um, going back to the social media images and template, um, we're curious uh, of some of the ways that you've been um, doing your social media throughout this month um, have the resources that, is, that we've shown you on this page been utilized uh, by your programs um, and have they been helpful or is there something else that um, as a comms team for the you know whole state that we can do to help make your work easier? We want to encourage folks, you can either use the chat or you are welcome to unmute. Absolutely. We'd love to hear your voices. And if you haven't had an opportunity to use this, what are some of the ways that you've been engaging your communities through Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month through social media? As we know, a lot of folks are not able to do in person. Um, so we'd love to know how that's going. So that's so, not right. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, like, have you been able to um, engage your community at all? I know that when I was a preventionist, um, I was given a lot of time um, and capacity to work on DBAM, but then um, not as much time. And there wasn't as much focus or emphasis on uh, teen dating violence awareness and prevention month. I think another way that we can look at this as well is um, what would, um, sorry, I'm getting a call. <laughs> if you had all of the time and resources in the world, what would you want to do for teen dating violence awareness and prevention months? 
Um, and we can see maybe how some of those things um, can maybe come to fruition with some of our help. Um, Erica, I see you put something in the chat. And what Erica shared is we have a hearts project happening at two school sites where youth write our positive our youth write positive messages to each other, but also receive teen dating violence material. And luckily we have school clubs at each of those schools. That's fantastic. I'm curious, how has the response been from the youth? So um, I'm pretty new to the position. I just got on board a couple of weeks back, but um, we have good engagement. Uh, our team has tried other techniques, but this one has been the most successful in the past years. So we're sticking to it, especially because we know that it allows social distancing to happen, right? As students are lining up, we can control that portion. Um, but then it's also, you know, each youth walks away with something positive, uh, some outreach material with the messaging about, you know, safe dating, and then um, our agency's information in case they ever need our resources. <clears throat> That's great. And I know it's challenging trying to navigate the social distancing and some schools are allowing folks on site, some aren't. We've heard, we've heard some of those challenges. Yeah. How about for others? How's that looking in your organ, in your area? I'm just putting a quick question into the chat. I'm wondering, what have you learned from youth in as you've been moving through Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month? You know, we've heard a lot. We've learned a lot um, as we've been working with the youth and I know our comms team has been working really diligently with the youth as they're developing the outreach toolkit and really handing the reins over. So we'd love to hear what are some of the learnings that folks are taking away from this month. And Maria shared, we have youth, or uh, we have children and youth advocates that work directly at the school and they do TD BAM chalking, um, teen dating goodie bags with informational materials, and that's through Monarch Services in Santa Cruz and Watsonville, California. That's fantastic. What kind of stuff is in the goodie bags? Because it's always that question. It's like, how do we how do we get that funded? Um, and I know listing things as behavioral modification tools is one of the ways to be able to get that. Um, but I'd love to hear what's in the goodie bags for the youth. So I'm going to pass it back to Jess to share with us about the outreach toolkit and uh, what some of that process has been. Thank you, Miranda. So I just have a few questions actually around whether you find a resource like this useful. Um, we definitely want to follow your needs and make sure that um, the way we're working with youth also supports adult preventionists in their work. And that was really the main uh, driver behind the outreach toolkit. So I have just a few questions for you. Um, based on what you saw in the presentation around the outreach toolkit, Christopher's video, that was a you know, major highlight. Um, do you think this will support your team's approach to outreach? Even just a yes or no in the chat. Yeah. 
is completely fine. Um, and if you want to unmute and explain if it's helpful or not, or what else would be needed, I would also really appreciate that because that kind of guidance really helps us tailor these tools. So the question is, do you think it's helpful? And don't worry, you won't hurt my feelings <laughs> if you say no. Let me put this back in the chat, just so you have the link handy. Feel free to take a minute to look at it. I know not everyone's had a chance, so. Hi hey everyone, good morning. My name is America from San Jose, California, working with Aki. So our program uh, primarily focuses on substance use prevention. And we go to, at the moment, two schools and we kind of help um, the students come up with the final project at the end. So we haven't been too, um, you know, um, flexible, I guess, in the, uh, I don't know, topics we could teach. But I think these toolkits would be very useful for our end to kind of get that uh, ball rolling and to kind of like uh, bringing, bring in other angles of topics that the students would most likely um, uh, will experience or see in their everyday lives. So yeah, we appreciate the toolkit you all provided for us. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you so much for that feedback. That is incredibly helpful. Um, and I'd love to learn more about your work too, um, about substance use prevention at some point. So. Uh, maybe we can connect via email. Some feedback in the chat too, that um, more resources are good. So thanks Erica and, and um, Jonki Patel also saying that it's useful. Um, so Maria is saying the CNY program create cards that say you have rights as a survivor and have more information regarding victims' rights, crisis line cards, pamphlets with info regarding teen dating violence they add chapstick and candies. That's awesome. Um, very creative use of resources too. Thanks for sharing that. And good inspiration too. I feel like whenever I'm in this group, I hear another creative thing. Like for DVAM, I heard about um, uh, coffee cozies, right? Like everyone needs one of those when they get coffee. So um, hearing about like, uh, like the candies and the chapstick, I'd never heard of that. And the, those are great ideas. Um, let's see, I'm also seeing that um, there's interest in sharing the toolkit with youth and we briefly speak about healthy relationships but are trying to find ways to speak more about it. Okay, as America mentioned, our program is substance prevention led. Okay, yeah, I, I would love, you know, I'm actually gonna put forward a poll in just a second about whether it's helpful for this kind of toolkit to be updated again next year. But um, based on your input here, um, I'd love to consider, uh, to have some considerations based on substance use prevention um, for maybe next year. So that kind of leads me to my next thing is the poll. Um, Miranda, I think you can launch that. This is just a simple like yes or no question. Do you want to see an updated version of a youth-led outreach toolkit next year? And this also, I'm also thinking, because your input has been so helpful so far, maybe we create like a very short survey for adult preventionists too, and like what, what your outreach needs are, and then we can work together with youth to make sure that we, um, we address those needs based on the youth expertise. Okay, so I think we have about 80% participation here. Um, if you wanna participate and you haven't yet, go ahead in the next uh, five seconds or so. Otherwise we can move on. And of course I'll share the results of the poll. <laughs> so I'm sure you're curious. Okay, thank you everyone for participating. So um, for the folks who did participate, there was 100% 
yes, that you would like to see this toolkit. So that's great to know, great feedback for us and um, how we spend our energies. Um, and there were 0% no's. So thank you very much. All right, next I wanted to um, talk about uh, Orange Day um, as a day of action to try to um, get prevention funding. Um, so uh, did you participate is my first question. And um, there's a toolkit. Um, did you use it? Michelle, I was just going to share a little of what was um, put in the chat. Um, we have someone who's brand new to the field as of yesterday, so welcome and really eager to, eager to learn um, and really drawn to any tools that utilize art as a way to engage folks, especially young people. So excited to hear about dance-based ideas in the toolkit. And I'm curious to know if any of you experienced, heard of, or how you may have incurred um, any resistance that any of you may have experienced or heard of, or in how you may have encouraged youth buy into these programs. I just wanted to bring up too, um, during our focus group with the youth back in October, I learned a lot from them about what some of the challenges have been in their outreach efforts. Um, for example, sometimes when they're tabling, um, someone will laugh at them or disregard or disrespect their efforts. And that's really hard, um, you know, hard, hard to process in that moment, hard when you get back from school. Um, and so that's kind of what is guiding a little bit of our, um, our youth convening uh, topics, basically. We're gonna have some youth presenters talk about what, what they're doing to around self-care and community care. Um, but that was kind of one of the like areas of struggle that I know I've heard from some youth in our focus group and just wondering like, is that another area where um, you, you know, adult preventionists have heard that can be hard and how have you addressed that? And then just to pivot back to, that's something to keep in mind in the background. I know Michelle was also asking you a question that um, uh, America just posted. So Michelle, if you wanna go back to Orange Day, that's good too. Um, yeah, uh, so she said, uh, we didn't participate in Orange Day this year, but we will look forward to share this info with our students in the time being and next year. So hopefully we'll be better prepared by then. Um, I do wanna say that Orange Day of Action doesn't just have to be on Orange Day. It was just kind of like our way of um, putting a time on it. So people like actually make a call. Um, we'll be working on this and 
we need people to call in from um, now until June or no, May. Um, and so I'm gonna be editing the toolkit just a little bit just to take off the date. Um, so please send that along. Um, hopefully you all received a letter from um, one of our youth um, uh, committee members uh, wrote a letter to go to other youth to encourage them to um, participate and call their legislators. And so um, if you didn't have that, uh, contact me and I'll send that to you. If I can uh, speak for a second. Um, mm -hmm. Hello everybody, my name is Quentin and I work uh, at Dove's Domestic Violence Education and Services, which is in Big Bear Lake, California. Uh, and my pronouns are he, him, his. And um, sorry, I'm joining this meeting very late because I was doing a group with some survivors uh, that ended at 11. But uh, I, I heard Miranda's question, um, you know, touching on, you know, how we engage youth, you know, in our work or give a voice to youth. Um, and this is definitely something, you know, that over the years of doing prevention work, um, I've tried to put more of a focus on um, in the beginning. Uh, when I started working here, I was kind of handed a curriculum um, that was very much like you go into the schools and you teach the kids this and you tell them these things and then you've done your job. Um, and so one of the first, you know, shifts I tried to start to make because I just saw it work so much better in practice. Um, was to really try to facilitate more discussion. Um, and that's something I'm always trying to repeat and make very clear that like I'm here, you know, to hear from you guys, to learn from you guys, to understand how you guys feel. Um, you know, I'm in there talking about, you know, relationships between teenagers. I'm not a teenager, you know, I'm not having relationships between teenagers. I don't, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. And trust me, when I was a teenager, I was not very good at it to begin with, you know. So, um, you know, I, I mostly focus on domestic violence, you know, and helping survivors here. Um, my, I'm, my title is program manager, um, and I manage the team of advocates who do direct service work. So my primary role is not even necessarily as a prevention educator. Um, we don't have anyone in our organization whose primary role, you know, is prevention education. Um, but, you know, my, I'm probably the person who does the most, or I'm definitely the person who does the most of that work. You know, I've been to a lot of trainings through the partnership. Um, and, you know, I, I probably have the biggest wealth of information. I do always try to incorporate, um, you know, bring other people into our organization into these presentations and discussions as much as I can. Um, but, you know, they say face a similar issue that I do that they have primary roles that a lot of time take up a lot of their times, you know, the people I'm bringing into our presentations are therapists and, you know, um, shelter advocates and stuff like that. So they almost have to put their primary work aside to focus on this very important topic. Um, and, and that's also, you know, being that I have kind of a lot on my plate, it's challenging for me to really take a lot of time to, you know, do things like discussion panels or, you know, meet with uh, clubs at the high school and stuff like that and really, you know, give them an opportunity to, to be heard. So I try to do it as much as I can when I'm in front of them, you know, when I'm doing these presentations slash discussions. I really don't like the word presentation because it has this idea that like I'm here to present stuff to you, um, which I do, but uh, but I really like, you know, discussion a lot more. And I wish there was a term I could come up with that kind of combines the two effectively. But, um, and, and, and that I get really excellent feedback from that. You know, I, I think when I did, like I said, in the work before and I would show up and I would tell kids, this is the way this is and, you know, pay attention and you'll learn a lot. And I'm here to tell you how things are like they would turn off and they would become disinterested. And, you know, whereas you can get them talking, get them engaged, get them to have a voice, it, then then things become really real, you know, and they're able to talk about what they're actually going through. And I'm able to customize my presentation materials to better suit those needs. And I always really appreciate, you know, when the partnership or when other larger agencies in California you know, have the staff and have the resources to, you know, have direct conversations with youth and put together curriculums and programs and materials that are, you know, youth centered. I try to access those as much as I can and take them into the work that I'm doing, you know, in my little corner of the world here in Big Bear. Um, so, you know, I try to stay in tune as much as I can to that stuff as well, because I feel like it's really valuable. Um, and, and this is a field, you know, working with youth, 
uh, that is so much ever changing. You know, every generation of youth, every year, you know, because we usually go in and do these presentations once a year, we have a really consistent program where we talk to all the freshman studies classes. Um, and just in the last five years, you know, the kids I'm talking to today are different in a lot of the ways, you know, to the kids I was talking to five years ago, they're thinking about different challenges, you know, they, they, they're navigating a different like social landscape. So the fact that we're constantly trying to stay updated and keep the, these things relevant, um, I feel like is most important, you know, in, in working with youth. So um, that's, that's kind of, you know, how I've done my best to, to keep youth as part of the conversation. Again, it, I, I do see it as kind of a challenge because I feel like I could be doing more, you know, and I don't think I'm asking, you know, youth enough, um, you know, leading up to these presentations or, or in the interim when we're not doing presentations, you know, what, what are the challenges you guys are facing? But like I said, I think uh, I, I do get a, a good um, amount of that information from the work that the partnership is doing and, and other agencies. That's why I like going to these, some of these trainings and talking to people who have prevention departments in their company that are, you know, three, four, five people deep, and they're going to a lot of schools and doing a lot of work. Um, and they really share a lot of really useful information with me. Um, because the other part of the issue that I run into is I'm not like a very techie person and I'm not like a very app driven person, you know, like, uh, I, I, I was on Facebook in my youth and then, uh, I, I pretty much gave up on all that. And, you know, like I still, you know, have to like post Instagram and Facebook for work if we're doing events and things like that. But, you know, I'm, I'm not like, I don't have like a deep TikTok following, you know, there's a lot of apps that come up that, you know, kids want to talk about. I've never heard of that. I have no idea what it is. So I take, need to take time to learn about that and understand the dynamics of that. Um, Cause all of that's, you know, super important. So, um, so I appreciate all the, the information I can get. For me, I usually come to these things looking for like, you know, maybe curriculum or, or activities or presentations or topics of discussion, you know, that we can really implement. And, and those are super, super valuable to me when I'm doing my, my prevention work. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, and especially, I know a lot of teams have that challenge of like this is having to wear those multiple hats and still still doing the prevention um, and absolutely part of what our goal is with the prevention peer network and a lot of our trainings is to be able to create those spaces for folks to network and, and to connect with preventionists across the state who are doing that work and um, it's like having a flashback of when I was in a local program and I was the prevention person um, and it's, it's challenging to do, but whatever you can put forward is, is fantastic. And I don't know if it resonates for others, but a lot of times instead of presentations, I'd use conversations because I really wanted to get that feedback. Like, I'm not just here to talk at you. Like, I want to have that conversation. Um, but yeah, those are some of the things and absolutely being able to include that in the toolkit for next year. I know folks may be putting stuff in the chat, but I just wanted to open it up. I definitely don't want to dominate the conversation, but I had one more thought that, um, you know, it's interesting, you know, hearing about, you know, when, when youth try to do this work that they might be like shamed or made fun of or something like that. Um, and, and that made me think about a, a different thing I run into. Um, when I do these, you know, discussions, a lot of times I'll have young people you know, um, particularly boys sometimes make like what would be deemed as like inappropriate comments, you know, or, you know, we'll talk about like relationship and communication and, you know, young boys will say like, oh, you know, well, you got to make sure, you know, you're controlling a girl or, you know, they'll say things that are like contrary to what we usually preach. Um, and I, I it, it's always interesting how to navigate those. Um, and what I don't want to do is just like shut that person down, you know, be, because they've come to the conversation, they're trying to contribute you know, oftentimes they might be pegged as like the class clown, you know, they might be serious, they might be joking, you know, things of that nature. So that that presents itself kind of 
I don't want to say like frequently, but it definitely pops up, you know, and, and I, I always just do my best to like hear that person out and try to understand like, well, are you joking? Are you serious? You know, like what, what, what exactly are you saying? Because a lot of times like this is, you know, the reality. And, and, you know, I mentioned, you know, when I was young and a, a teenager and dating, like uh, your views probably, you know, for any gender, but I know from my experience as a male, you know, I'm very much driven by like pop culture and, you know, I grew up in like a very, you know, masculine and almost toxic culture, you know, you know, this is how you're supposed to behave. And this is how your, you know, friends are going to judge you based on, you know, your body count and stuff like that. So um, it, it, when those things are verbalized in, in a discussion, I always try not to say, you know, like, no, 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 that's wrong. Don't do that. You know, you got to behave this way. You know, it's, um, but then at the same time, it's like not always the, you know, the easiest to, rebut or whatever you know because those those things are incorrect but they're, they're very much people's personal truth particularly when you're young you know and you're trying to navigate these waters so um that those are always kind of some of the most interesting points you know when i have these like young brash males who want to like talk about you know and they're like say say something and all their friends like high five them in the back of the room and stuff you know those are always like uh, i think some of the most interesting times of, of presentation work it's it's always tricky to navigate that because you don't want to shut them down, but you want to bring them into the conversation while mm -hmm. also calling out, like, let's talk about that is one that I use a lot to the point that people wanted to get me a shirt. That said, let's talk about that. Um, but it is, it's, it's tell me more about that and what, what are the goals there? And if you're like, if you have to have the passcodes and all of that to your partner's phone, do they get to have the passcodes to yours? And how would that look? And, you know, like, trying to find ways to start navigating that and where where does some of this come from and how would it feel to be in a relationship where someone is you know exerting that kind of of control and and like being able to like tease that out more to really start thinking it through and thinking about what does this look like in a healthy relationship because we're not about like I know the conversations we were having like when I started in prevention a long time ago and it was you know very criminal justice focused and it's really I love the shift to really looking at what's healthy what's unhealthy and like what are all the shades within that and what how does that show up um because I know like when I would work with youth not just at juvenile hall um but that was one area where that that toxicity could really be amped up um, because you have to front and like that's a survival mechanism. So being able to talk about that and it and like finding ways to be able to have that conversation where it was challenging that narrative um, while also inviting them into that conversation was was tricky to navigate, but absolutely worth it. Because sometimes I'd have those youth when I'd go out and do you know presentations or whatnot in the schools. And they'd be like, well, you said this. And I'm like, absolutely, let's talk about it. Um, so yeah, it's being able to make some of those, it's it's that piece of prevention that can be challenging and that it's it's incremental changes. It's not something where you're gonna go in and do one time, you know, we're gonna take this toolkit in and boom, everybody's gonna, you know, have healthy relationships. Like it's it's that constant. Um, shifting the narrative that is so prevalent in our society and we're taught very much not to look at. I think something that you made me think of, Quentin, is the, the value in peers hearing some of these messages from their own peers. Um, and sometimes when I was in the classroom and I would have a youth, you know, give pushback or say a comment at the back of the room or something like that. Um, one of the things I would always sometimes or I would do sometimes was um, put it back to the rest of the class and ask, well, what does the room think about this to see if there was anybody who, you know, was kind of brave enough in that moment to step up and provide like an alternate um, thought to what was being said. Um, and it was just interesting to watch them kind of like learning from one another as opposed to just hearing my adult voice in that space. Yeah, it sounds like a really excellent, you know, opportunity for them to all, you know, have, have input. And I think sometimes I would, 
you know, when, when these topics come up, I, I almost panic and I'm like, oh no, like I got to stay on topic, you know, like I don't want to let somebody else dominate the conversation, which is like not how I should be thinking at all, you know, but sometimes I feel like I have that internal response, like in the, in the moment, you know? So yeah, I think that could be a, a really excellent way to go about it. Sometimes you go in with, this is a conversation we're going to have, but as you get into that, like they need to go in a whole different direction and it's okay to do that. As long as they're not taking you down like the wrong rabbit holes. <laughs> you know, thinking about, like, there, I walked into a classroom and, and they had twilight stuff everywhere, which yes, I'm dating myself there, but I was like, wow, like walking into the, yeah. I had, I had like lion's den coming into my head and I was like trying to be gentle because the teachers obviously got this stuff everywhere. And as we started talking, she was motioning to me like, go there, go there. I was like, so let's talk about Twilight. And like, it opened up this whole discussion whereas the youth had been really quiet before. They checked in afterwards. I'm like, I'm sorry for me, you know, like really taking, taking into like challenging this narrative around this book and she's like no I hate the dynamics and the relationship but it's what they're reading and I was like okay great let's talk about it um it's always trying to navigate that I think something that's also coming up a lot in this discussion um today is the kind of building off what Miranda was just saying about kind of letting the youth decide maybe this is where we need to go today um and then as Quentin was saying about and Melody as well about like peers learning from each other uh some we've been talking about recently a lot just in our group about how youth don't actually have a lot of choices and don't actually get to make a lot of decisions for themselves and particularly if you think about the school environment there are a lot of rules there's a lot of mandatory curriculum homework um, you have to raise your hand to go to the bathroom. You can even decide like, I want to go to the bathroom. So for them to be in a space where then they can give input that's actually like taken into account and heard about and where it's given respect and they're given respect as like real individuals, um, not just as like students in a classroom, I think is huge and something that we've been seeing um, and that I've noticed like trying to do with this particular teen dating aware violence awareness and prevention campaign of not just saying, oh, it's youth led, but still like us adults making the decisions, but youth led actually means youth led. And I know that some of you will have like curriculums that you're going with or like ideas, of course, like we, we still want that. We're not saying don't do that, but it's just kind of taking that and melding it with what does it really mean to be a youth today? And what does it mean to truly bring them in? Yeah, you know, one thing uh, from the focus groups uh, that came up frequently was, you know, they have all these ideas of like, oh, you know, I want to talk to my peers. Our school should really be teaching us about um, healthy relationships and, um, uh, we should have more like counselors who could support us in our mental health and things like that. And then they really felt um, powerless, uh, you know, with their school administration or like their school board or, you know, having any control over that curriculum. I don't know, has anyone else uh, encountered that? That was like a very common um, theme. I think one of my follow-up questions, and thank you for bringing that up, Michelle, um, I definitely heard that theme too, is, you know, we really heard like a, a hunger from youth around how can we 
how can we organize around specific goals? Like if we have an unfair dress code policy, um, wh what can we do about it? Who can we talk to? And this really is the, the essence of community organizing. I know that um, just even within our own field, we have some very talented community organizers. Um, and I wonder if, if that kind of information or I don't know, just like some, some best practices around how, like, how do you, how do you have those individual conversations with other youth or unhealthy relationships, but then how do you take that, um, take those lessons or those, those uh, kind of principles that you're trying to advance and then like bring them to your school administration or bring them to your policymaker? Do you think that's something that the youth you work with um, would be interested in learning more about? getting resources on. Is there capacity to support the youth in this way? I know that's another big issue too. It's like what you know one more thing that's um, tough to make time for. I'll share a story that happened recently in our community that I found fascinating um, that kind of speaks to this. Um, recently, uh, I think it was the football coach got fired um, and the students really liked this teacher and really appreciated him as a coach. Um, and I don't think any sort of like good reasoning was given as to why this person was terminated other than like, you know, he's not tenured so we can terminate him for any reason. Um, and I uh, saw that some of the students had started like a petition online um, and took to social media to some of like our local, you know, like Big Bear News, Facebook, what, you know, like the social media things that exist online, um, you know, and really just explain the situation and told people in the community, hey, we're trying to rally around this teacher and support them and, you know, try to get them some justice, you know, because they were wrongfully terminated. Um, and that really, you know, seemed to catch some some steam. There was a lot of discussion about it going on on the on social media sites. Um, and I just thought that was an interesting. And I think it was a, a sophomore who was kind of leading the charge, you know, um, and, and getting everything going because they felt, really felt like uh, injustice had happened. And, and that was one way that they were able to kind of find a voice and and get at least some conversation going. I don't know, you know, what the result will end up being. Um, but I thought that was an interesting way to kind of, you know, utilize, you know, social media for for a positive purpose. I know I love seeing um, the like TikTok youth just like troll registration pages. It, um, you know how they like have people register to fill up like a venue, but then they never show up, um, you know, against causes that they uh, don't like. Um, yeah, I just feel like so many of them are fired up about all these issues and really knowledgeable about it, but then just don't know how to direct their like power and excitement somewhere. And America had shared, students themselves are pushing back on the dress codes and sharing their experiences on social media. But then the schools or admis administration might use scare tactics and try to bring consequences to them. And absolutely, that's where advocacy becomes so important and, and supporting the youth and knowing what their rights are. Because um, I remember I got in trouble for swearing on campus once and um, they were trying to tell me like, oh, we can call the police because this is a crime and blah, 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 like all this stuff. And I was like, you're holding a phone book. You're not holding anything. Like you're telling me the codes are in here, but you're holding a phone book, which doesn't, like it has a lot of codes, but it doesn't have civil or criminal codes. And there's like, I'm highly doubting you can actually penalize me. And you're not, con you're concerned about my swearing, but you're not concerned about the boy who was trying to grab my breasts that the teacher also saw, but he's facing no consequences. Here's his name, here's the class he's in right now. You need to bring him in. And I'm also calling my mom to come down and like advocate. But it was so frustrating because the, like they weren't paying attention to what led up to, um, you know, like, oh, it's just boys being boys. And I was like, no, that's not the conversation we're having. <laughs> and it was, it was really challenging, but it was part of why I was able to 
do that and to call that out is because I had been supported to do that. Um, whereas I wonder for how many students they're facing things similar and not having, not having the understanding that like you get to speak up and, and the ways that, you know, my privilege definitely showed in that space. Um, so I'm wondering how we can continue to help support elevating youth voices and thinking about how we can leverage our power as adults to be able to create more space for youth to be able to speak up on the issues that are important to them. Um, Miranda, wondering if I should move on to this next section of our campaign toolkit. This is amazing conversation and I'm taking a lot of notes to inform our campaign next year. So thank you to everyone. Um, so I discussed the, the youth convening briefly about maybe a half an hour ago. If you weren't there to join us when I was talking about it, I'm gonna put the event link uh, in the chat really quick so you can look at it Let me just find it in our calendar really quick, one, one sec. Um, and I just wanna ask you a few questions about the youth convening. Here's the link. Okay, so as I mentioned, the youth convening actually touches on many of these topics, which we were discussing. Um, how can youth exercise that self and community care when outreach, the outreach process is difficult, uh, when their efforts aren't being you know, respected. One of the, uh, the youth presenters who is going to be joining us actually reminded me, it's not just other youth who may you know, make fun of your efforts. It could also be adults who like minimize efforts, adults in the administration, um, teachers. And so how, you know, how do you deal with that basically? Um, you know, not only is it about self and community care, but it's about just creating the, a hopefully a comfortable space to express our emotions with a, a few awesome um, poetry readings about the pandemic and how youth have been creative and resilient as well during the pandemic, in addition to the stressors. Um, also community organizing, like I think we're really starting to um, I would say like kind of dip our toe into that, like sharing sharing the wealth of knowledge that we know our team actually has. We have several community organizers um, who are part of the partnership team. Mercedes Toon, who some of you may know, is um, one of them and does excellent work in Tuolumne County. Um, and she's gonna be presenting on Community Organizing 101. So another kind of item that uh, youth can learn from Outreach efforts, how are the youth um, adapting their outreach during the pandemic? What are the social media strategies? Um, what are the specific, how are youth communicating with other youth right now? So those are just some of the topics and I had a few questions around that. Just wanted to see based on what you've heard today and maybe if you had a chance to read the brief paragraph description, does this sound like an activity that any of the youth that you work with would be interested in participating in. I just want to put a yes or no in the chat. That would be awesome. So basically, do the youth you work with want to learn from other youth, maybe in another community? Have you kind of heard some questions from them where they might benefit from connecting with other youth? I hear your thoughts on that.
what's my other question here? Um, are there youth leaders you'd recommend for facilitating discussions? Oh, I'm starting to get some info too from Quentin. I'd be happy to share this info with the youth I'm working with. Okay, great. A uh, quick question for the conference above, could we register our students or could they register themselves? Yeah, um, we would like for individuals to register. So um, if they could just register for themselves, um, that would be awesome. That way we can just like get their, actually, you know what? Um, no, it's fine. As long as you have their email and their consent basically to register, it's fine if you register them, but it's like, we need like form submissions done in, on an individual basis. I guess that's what I meant to say. Cause that helps us like keep a list going. And um, of course, you know, we're paying the youth $50 to participate. So helps us like be able to cross check, you know, attendance with our registration. Um, age group, I would say this is open for middle schoolers and high schoolers and also, you know, college students. Um, I know we have one student who, this is her first year in college. She'll be presenting a little bit about her work on campus as well. I would say as far as parents go, so this is really meant to inform youth about strategies that other youth are, are using for teen dating violence prevention work. So it's not as much geared toward parents, like it doesn't provide the basic information about you know, supporting youth, um, uh, looking for red flags, uh, being a trusted adult. It's not as much geared toward parents, I would say, but that's an excellent question. So yeah, it sounds like people are still deciding whether it would be valuable and that's totally okay, but it's um, good to know that you have these questions and that we can address them. Also just wanted to know like, are there any youth ha who have really stood out in your efforts who have been very creative thinkers, um, who have inspired their peers, who have done amazing work because we're always looking to connect with youth and um, uplift their voices in different ways. This convening is one of them, but um, you know, we're constantly trying to think of ways to you know, bring youth together so they can learn from one another or inform the partnerships efforts basically. Uh, Quinton, we, we do have, um, a shareable image actually we posted on Instagram. Do you think that would be helpful if I just sent you that Instagram link? Okay, great. I will make sure to put that in the chat. Trying to find that. Oh, here it is. Calling all these leaders. There's that Instagram link. Okay, well, if anything comes up, just feel free to email me. I'll put my email in the chat. Appreciate all your questions so far. I think at this point, I mean, um, in our agenda, we had created some time for questions. Um, Michelle, did you have any other like kind of discussion questions you wanted to put forward as well? I can pass it back to you. Um, yeah, I think my main thing is just, you know, what um, did you find helpful uh, among the things we talked about? And then what could we do to support you um, in future awareness months. I think part of the feedback that I'm hearing is that perhaps um, we need to be a little more creative with the materials that we're putting on, uh, out, sorry, how can we go beyond social media? How can we go beyond just um, uh, domestic violence programs, but really like our community partners, community programs, um, 
social justice programs, like how can we create materials for them that are usable to um, programs beyond just um, exclusively domestic violence and teen dating violence. And thank you everyone for today's conversation. This has been really good and we very much appreciate you staying with us and giving us um, all of the feedback and being able to hear about some of the things. Yeah, um, thank you for all this info. Uh, perhaps being the bridge for organizations to know about resources available for program specialists and any other trainings coming up. Absolutely. So I'm gonna put my information in the chat again. Um, so like joining the prevention peer network, if folks are interested, please send me an email. This can connect you with our prevention listserv, as well as making sure that you're receiving our newsletter and any mailings about events that are coming up. If you are a member, um, this is a free opportunity for you. If you are not a member, this is still a free opportunity for you. And we can absolutely still connect you with the listserv and all of the mailings. Um, yeah, and yes, we've had a lot of students talk about mental health and how a lot of their peers are experiencing high levels of stress and anxiety. So I think expanding your reach to mental health would be helpful as well. And thank you for all the resources you provided with us today. Absolutely. And thinking about those mental health impacts on youth, especially as we are in year three of the pandemic, it's, um, it's not the only factor, but it is pretty huge in terms of its impacts and a lot of times when we're having those conversations, it's really geared at adults' impacts and we need to be providing a lot more support for youth. Any final or closing thoughts that folks wanted to share? All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And we are.